Hello, you are listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com and UnlimitedEnergyNow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Now, I have a very special guest to, for you today, Steve Noble. Steve Noble is the founder of Soul Matrix Healing and the author of a fantastic book called The Spiritual Entrepreneur. Now, personally, I there's two kinds of books I like to read. I love to read all about natural healing, and I also like to read about business because I've had my own business in natural healing for 30 years. You can do it. <laughs> and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, you can find out more about Steve Noble and his wonderful work at his website, thesoulmatrix.com. Welcome, Steve Noble. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure to be back. Now, Steve Noble, your book is called The Spiritual Entrepreneur. What exactly is a spiritual entrepreneur? Well, um, we all know what entrepreneurs are. They're people who engage in some form of trade, selling products or services. But a spiritual entrepreneur is someone who has um, who has a spiritual life, a spiritual practice. They have spiritual values and spiritual interests. And after a while, you know, uh, I find a lot of what I call star seeds. People are my audience, people who are the weird and wonderful uh, tribe of star seeds. Uh, for a lot of them, they they don't find a fit in the conventional world in a company. They, they, the only way they can do it is to, to do their own thing, to kind of launch their own stuff and they can put out their own message, their own offering, whatever they want to do. You can be as weird and wonderful as you want then. Nobody's telling you what you can do. So a spiritual entrepreneur is someone with spiritual values, spiritual practice, interest in spirituality, and at the same time has a business. And that business could be an accountant. It could be a spiritual accountant. You know, it's great to have a spiritual accountant. We all need good accountants who've got good values and are kind of very open-minded. I know spiritual uh, graphic designers, uh, spiritual uh, people who design websites. You know, it, it doesn't mean you, there's a lot, of course, who go into healing and theta healing and Reiki and Akashic Records. And there's all that. There's a whole gamut there. But also there are a lot of other services, which I would still call spiritual entrepreneur because they're serving their clients are also, by and large, spiritual people who want someone to help them with spiritual images. I've got a great graphic designer who just knows exactly what I need, you know, and all and so on. And so, a great VA actually, you know, she's wonderful, angel of my VA. So and so on. Yeah. So I think anyone who's really got the two: a business and a spiritual life. Okay, I just love that and. You know, I'm 64. I've had my own business since I was 34. And, you know, when I started out, I, I, I mean, I had very core, deep core values that I continue to this day. And my best friend recently gave me a compliment and it made me so happy because she has all these friends who have a lot of money. But she said, Catherine, you have a lot of money but you run your business almost like a charity. I give away so much free information. I'm always helping people. And that desire to be of service permeates absolutely everything I do. But at the same time, I'm successful in my own, you know, in the conventional way. I own my house. I own my car. I have investments at Morgan Stanley. I'm financially set. I'm financially free. I can do whatever I want, <laughs> you know, and I did it all doing natural healing. And so I'm so passionate about us sharing this because it's what I feel that when we're living by our own values and our true core values and spiritual values, that's when you're going to be the happiest. That's where you're going to be the healthiest. And that's when you're going to be the most successful. Well, I think the whole idea of service is also key, actually. It's a good point because um, spiritual entrepreneurs tend to have a strong desire to give. I mean, there's always a kind of kind of that infinity sign of giving and receiving, of course. We don't just want to give endlessly. We burn out. Um, 
but spiritual entrepreneurs tend to want to give to make an impact on the world to make a difference in the world whereas i think conventional entrepreneurs go in it with the, the idea of i just want to make a load of money and um you know i know some conventional entrepreneurs and it's great to be abundant i think the difference like you've got money and it's about being abundant isn't it mm -hmm. that you can do what you want go where you want uh, and money is just a fuel for the journey it's a bit like imagine you've got a spaceship and you're traveling from earth to venus or wherever you want to go you don't want to run out halfway and, and the money is that fuel it's not the object of you know some people make it the object of their journey but when they they end their life you know at the end of the end of the life no one i think thinks oh i'm so excited that i spent so many hours in the office or i'm so excited i've got so many so much money in the bank i mean that is not it's what difference you've made how many people you've loved connected with what you've done so i think that is you know service to other is and of course there is a service to self we also want to thrive but the main focus is service to other that's the difference yeah you're right so Steve Noble, you yourself have had a really interesting career path and many people who end up as spiritual entrepreneurs also did not start out that way. Would you share for our audience what other jobs you've had before now? Because I think a lot of people think, well, I'm a librarian. I always have to be that way. You know, they're stuck yeah. in a picture of what they're supposed to do. Yeah, I started off life. Um, my father was very again he was working class guy and very against university he didn't mind me studying at school like high school you call it in america but he was like you know what get a job and go earn some money and i really loved learning but my job i thought well what do i really what can i do i was a bit confused you know teenagers don't always know what they want to do my family um valued security pretty highly and a lot of families did of those times i suppose so i went into banking in the city of london international banking is all dealing with it wasn't local branch banking it was dealing with big amounts of money you know people investing lots of money people transferring big amounts of money exporting importing all of that stuff uh, by, by and large i was a round peg in a square hole did not fit did not like it it was a very weird mindset for me because th there the focus was about making money for the shareholders that's all they cared about and the uh, people, by and large, working in there only cared about the bonus at the end of the year. They didn't really care about the ethics even at that time. And um, hopefully it's different now. But when I questioned some of the ethics, and for example, one of the one of the things I questioned was why are we funding? Uh, there was the Shah of Iran at the time when I was working in banking. Why are we funding daily uh, tanks for the Shah of Iran? And why are we financing that? And everyone said to me, just forget it. Just worry about your bonus. That was the whole ethos at the time maybe it's still the same i don't know after 10 years i left i couldn't hack it anymore i went into local government and local government for special housing elderly housing and there was some young learning difficulties so it's a very different environment from right wing conservative to left wing socialists a very big shock a bit of a shock for my system but i did that for 10 years and then I was really doing a lot of spiritual work at the time. And all of my life was aligning with my spiritual values, except my work, except money. So one day I asked the universe, should I resign? And I got the message back on a T-shirt, Nike T-shirt, just do it. <laughs> and so I was like, hey, there's the sign. I've got to do it. And my ego went, don't be stupid. You know, you're, you've got a good job, money, security, da, 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 da. So I went, yeah, that's a T. How can I resign because of a T-shirt? I was walking down the road again. And then I, I was pulled to a window. The same sign in the window. I mean, who puts a Nike sign in their window? Anyway, it, they put it for me. I resigned. The next day, there was a double rainbow. I'm like, I'm on the track. I'm I'm, I'm on my track. So um, I went from there, basically, after 20 years of conventional jobs, into doing everything, painting, gardening, selling blue-green algae. I was just doing anything and everything to kind of, I'm floating, you know, I'm like swimming. How do I... Um, and then I started working in a spiritual organization. I became a director of that organization for 13 years, promoting spiritual authors, you know, all the, the famous ones, Julia Cameron, Deepak Chopra, uh, Wayne Dyer, um, Eckhart Tolle. I met them all and all of these kind of characters. And it was kind of a dream, really. I wanted to meet these wonderful people and hear them. So I, in that time, I put on about 2,000 author talks. Uh, and then I left in 2000. And 12, I had the, the urge, I know I needed to move on. Otherwise, I'd just be stuck in this job because my passion for it was waning. But at the same time, I loved it. And I went into this bit of a dark space for a dark night of the soul for six years. I didn't, I kind of lost 
you know, I went and drove a London bus for a year and I was doing all kinds of weird stuff. And then I came out of that dark night and then the spirit started speaking to me again. And it said, do this, you know, and I talk about star seeds and ascension and angels and archangels. And it was a bit like, whoa, you know, you, I, I, I have been in the spiritual zone, but this is a bit more way out for me. But anyway, I said yes. And I started. So I've been, yeah, from conventional jobs, including even driving a bus to directing a spiritual organization, very successful, still is successful. And now doing what I'm doing, which is successful. And I'm more abundant now than I've probably ever, ever been in my life in all ways, I would say. That's such a fascinating story. Now, Steve Noble, um, how can spiritual entrepreneurs shift out of their old identity? So somebody who's listening to this broadcast and maybe they're working in banking or they're working as a bus driver or they're a gardener and they want to have the courage to step into a spiritual entrepreneur role. How can they shift out of their old identity into their new identity, serving the planet and healing others. Well, it takes a bit of work and awareness because identity is, is something that most people aren't really aware that they're holding. But if, if someone really identifies in a role and that role could be, I am the boss of this place, or I am a paper shuffler or a banker or an administrator or a widget maker, whatever the thing is, the longer you do it, uh, the longer the potential is for you to start saying, this is what I am and start saying, this is all I know. So when I was in banking, particularly thinking about leaving, but I thought, I don't know anything else in the workplace. I've not really done anything else. And so it's all kind of the comfort zone or familiarity zone. That was my edge. And so outside of that zone was, was the unknown. And everyone comes to that place, what they know and what they don't know. And the edge of it is scary. Because, hey, what if I'm not any good at anything else? You know, all of this kind of thing. So there's a story um, of, of, of someone I, I, knew, I know very well, actually, uh, known for years. And she worked at, as an administrator in um, the medical system, health system. She did it for years. She, I mean, she got a degree in administration and public administration and went into becoming an administrator, was good at it good at organizing and everything else, but she was also a healer part-time and um, she, but she was also a mother and really identified as I'm a mother. I'm an administrator. She's very strong, you know, to break that took a while and it didn't really take off her healing for a while because she kept on, her mind kept coming back, but I'm really, that's just a hobby for me. And she had to break that in her mind, become really aware of this is the identity I'm holding and shift into a new identity. Now, when I was a director of alternatives, I really identified because I loved, I'm a director of a spiritual organization. I loved it. And people would ask me at parties, hey, what do you do? And I would tell them and I'm meeting all these fabulous people and I felt very proud of it. But when I left that organization and I thought, well, what, 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 how do I describe myself? And the only thing I could say was, uh, well, I'm an author because I, I'd written three books, but I really only thought it was a hobby. I didn't really identify properly as an author. It was, it's not, I didn't take it seriously. And so I really, I, I did a workshop and I realized at that workshop that I am not taking myself and what I'm doing seriously. And I made the statement, I am a spiritual writer. And it was like, um, but it was really like an affirmation. I'm a spiritual writer. And it was really like, whew, I had to breathe in it, but I, I, parts of me don't really believe it, you know, and I had to sit with that affirmation. I'm a spiritual writer until I could really start sitting in it going, well, I've written three books. Why shouldn't I call myself a writer? And when someone did ask me at some gathering, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a writer. And it was like, yeah, I can say that. And I felt I could say it. to shift from a director to I'm a writer to I'm an entrepreneur was another shift. Because the, the thing is, if you've if anybody has worked in a company, they develop what I call um, employee thinking. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in my book, I talk about it a lot, employee thinking. There's the nine to five. There's rules that have to be followed. There's a, if you want to get on in the company, you do this, you do that. But when you become an entrepreneur, you can't run your life in the same way. You can't do nine to five. You can't follow the rules as you do in a company. You know, breaking a rule, for example, breaking a rule in a company means you might get fired. But as an entrepreneur, you need to bend the rules all the time. I'm not saying don't pay your taxes. I'm saying your mindset of how it has to be are rules that you've got in your mind. And those rules have to be questioned and channeled, a challenge, challenged, I should say, not challenged, 
channeled, challenged. So every rule cannot, you know, I can't do that will be run rule that has to be challenged. Why not? Why can't you do that? Who says you can't do that? Do it. Let's suck it and see, you know, the, the thing of suck it and see, try it out. A lot of rules have to be broken. Things about time, things about, there's certain limits um, as an employee, for example. Uh, an employee usually can't make decisions. The decisions are made by CEOs. And even the CEO is restricted by boards and shareholders. But as an entrepreneur, there's no one restricting you. It's almost like there are invisible, invisible restraints in the mind that have to be broken. You know, the elephant being tied by a rope to a tree stump type of thing. Mm -hmm. Even when the elephant is freed, it still imagines it's tied there. You know, and it's it's locked there. So we have to free our minds and free what we can do. Uh, when I began the journey, I was in Greece and um, I had this download, which turned out to be a transmission meditation of a goddess energy. And I thought, but I don't have a womb. I shouldn't be doing it. It was a rule in my mind. If I have a don't have a womb, I shouldn't be channeling the goddess energies. But I had to break that rule and go, OK, I'll do what the universe wants me to do and i started channeling all this goddess energy and my youtube channel is now um 167,000 practically so it worked i just said basically as an entrepreneur spiritual entrepreneur it's good to say yes to what spirit says if spirit says yes not the ego you have to know the difference between ego yammy yamma and spirit going this is a good way knowing that difference makes all the difference really and then you can move forward just saying yes so it's really stepping out of the limitation of an employee mindset into an entrepreneur mindset, which is ever expanding. I'm ever expanding. Every day is different. There is no routine. Like we are used to routines as employees, but as an entrepreneur, there's no routine. Today, I might be having a, a, an interview with you. Tomorrow, I might be designing a course or doing something else. You know, it's very, very different. And it takes a while to settle into that slightly more volatile um, I find it very exciting that I don't have a strict routine, that there's always something different that can happen. To, that it becomes very exciting for me. So hopefully the more you can fit into that, um, that identity of being an entrepreneur, the more the old identity of employee goes out the window. Great insights. And, you know, again, I've had my own business now for 30 years doing natural healing. And you talked about, you know, breaking the rules. What I found helpful, Steve Noble, is to create my own rules. And so for 30 years, I've had three fundamental rules. Number one, everything I do has to be of total integrity. Number two, everything has to be good for me and good for my clients. In other words, win-win at all stages of the business. And number yeah. three, everything I have to do, do has to be fun. Because yeah. if it's fun, I'll keep doing it. And if it's yeah. fun, it's life giving, it's energy building, and I can, it's sustainable. So many people are used to businesses where they burn themselves out. And, you know, the fourth thing that I would say is that I began, but with the idea of creating the life that I want to live. You know, lots of people think, well, when I retire, you know, I'll do this spiritual business. Well, it's like, you know, if I died to tomorrow, I, I would love everything I'm doing today. There's no regrets. There's nothing missing out. Now, with that, let's take a break and listen to a message from one of our commercial sponsors. And we'll be right back with Steve Noble, author of The Spiritual Entrepreneur. Steve Noble, founder of Soul Matrix Healing. What do you see as the biggest block to spiritual entrepreneurs becoming financially successful? Well, well before I answer that, I just want to mention something you said before the little commercial break, because your rules are great. I think the win-win rules is, is great. Um, most, most companies operate on win-lose. We win and we elbow everyone else out the way. Um, the idea of fun, I think, is brilliant, because when I was at Alternatives, one of the principles we had was we only put on an author that we actually enjoyed listening to. So <laughs> if we didn't feel fun, if we didn't feel excited, we don't put them on. And I remember one major celebrity, very well-known person came on, did a, did a talk was so they weren't exactly boring, but they were, 
a bit seedy, I thought I'd say. That's what I'd say. So we just said, no, out. We don't have you back. We don't care how big you are. And living the life of, yeah, at the, at the, when I was at Alternatives, and certainly the company now I'm doing, is helping others dream bigger. I think it's very important, helping others to dream bigger, because dreaming is actually how we birth a new reality and a, big, a bigger world. And, of course, the foundation has to be integrity. So, yeah. Now, let me come back to your question now. I just I could I had to answer that one, Catherine. It's such a brilliant uh, four points you made there. Um, so the biggest block to spiritual entrepreneurs becoming financially successful because I think a part of what holds people back is they think I can't make any money, and yet I it's like on my, on a previous radio show I told everybody my net worth. I thought okay, bad idea, but I have zero debt, and you know it's I I have. I have a life I love. I can work as long as I want. I love helping people. So I'll probably do it till the day I die, but I'm financially set. Yeah. So how can spiritual entrepreneurs become financially successful? And what's what do you see as their biggest block? Yeah, well, I think it is good to be debt-free. I am debt-free, but I think for, while people have to take on some debt, if they feel they have to, then you can actually look at it like someone trusts in you to invest in you and your life and your company, and they trust that you'll pay them back. So, so there are people listening to this that feel that they, they do have some debts. I know some people do invest in their own personal development, take on a debt for a while until they can pay that back. But I would say to answer the question directly is the, the biggest block is um, limits in the mind as to what is possible. And we all have limits in the mind and also limits in the body, you know, in our, our emotional body. We had limits to joy, how much joy we allow ourselves, limits to abundance. I can have this much and any, anything beyond that feels, whoa, you know what? That feels really uncomfortable. People have these natural limits. The biggest resistance that entrepreneurs face in moving forward is, of course, fear. Fear is the foundation of all forms of resistance in moving forward. And resistance can take any kind of shape or form. It can take a general kind of anxiety. And there's lots of people that wake up as entrepreneurs worrying about stuff. You know, they're always going to wake up and they're worrying. They go to bed worrying about stuff. That's not a good thing to do, really. It's better to go to bed meditating and having a clear head and wake up with a clear mind, not going to bed worrying, obsessing about stuff. Doubt is another big one. And at the foundation of all this is some, some form of fear. Doubt that they're good enough, capable enough, resourceful enough, you know, that things are possible for them. Doubt is another one. Confusion, being confused by too many people's opinions or what the market's doing or what the government's saying. You know, none of those. Um, I don't worry about any of those things really anymore. You know, I, I worry about, don't worry about what the economy's doing. I don't worry about what the government's saying because actually, when, for example, when COVID hit and the glo global lockdown happened, I my business increased about 25%, maybe 30%. So I already had a strong intuition beforehand to put everything online. Bring every, even when I was at Alternatives, a spiritual organization, I was starting to put everything online. I even advised them, put everything online. And they said, no, we can't do that. It's too much work. And then um, when COVID hit, they had to backtrack really fast. They did it really brilliantly. So listening to listening, if fear will block intuition, of course, um, fear of worst case scenarios. This is a big one for a lot of people. And I would advise people to ask themselves, what is my worst case scenario to make it more conscious? Because if it's a kind of unconscious fear, it's always rumbling underneath kind of this vague rumbling. So when I started my journey, I asked myself, what is my biggest fear? And my biggest fear was homelessness, mm. you know, mm. having no money, bankruptcy, but the actually the fear itself was more about being homeless. And so I had to really sit with it thinking, well, you know, um, what would it be like if I was homeless? And I actually went to a big park in central um, North London, actually Hampstead Heath. It's a massive, massive park. And I found a, a beautiful place uh, with trees and everything. And I thought, well, if I'm homeless, I'm coming here. There's a bar park bench and there's loads of trees around. I'll sleep here, you know, and um, I faced my fear. And I do encourage people to face their fear because um, if they don't face it, they don't often know what it is. But when we face it, we start to convert it into excitement. Fear and excitement are very close energies. Anybody who does adventure sports know if they jump out of a plane, before you jump out of their plane, you're going to be terrified. But when you're flying through the air, you're like, whoa, this is amazing. I did abseiling with my son when he was 14. 
uh, I was terrified. I thought it was a good idea. And I went up the mountain and I looked down. I was like, oh, my God, what have I just, what have I done? <laughs> my son was terrified. I was terrified. But when we went down, we were both highly exhilarated because the fear turned to high excitement. And that is the thing with fear. There's that brilliant book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, by Susan Jeffers, who I met several times at Alternatives. It's a wonderful. She's passed over now. Wonderful speaker. Wonderful author. When we face an important fear, it turns into fuel for the journey. It turns into power. There is a saying in magical circus, circles, where there is fear, there is power. And it's not the kind of fear about stepping into a speeding car, because we know those kind of, uh, we don't want to go stepping out in the highway. But like public speaking is one of the worst fears that some people hold, you know, or facing someone that you need to put a boundary on. We need to face the fear and do it anyway. And then we find that our journey can move forward. If we ignore our fears or if we start pushing to one side and trying, don't try and I don't want to say to people, don't put a band aid over your fears, face them, feel the energy and use it, engage in it and, and draw it in for your life. Don't and let it become an ally. I remember an actor friend of mine who worked in the corporate world. He said, well, look, Everyone has butterflies, but in the acting world, we learn to train the butterflies and put them in formation. You know, so the butterflies fly in formation. I thought, that's cool. So I heard this famous actor, Laurence Olivier, you know, Oscar winning, brilliant actor. He was almost physically sick before most of his performances. He was so nervous. And I found it's normal to be nervous when you're engaging in a big venture or a new audience or something, but allow the energy to feed where you're going don't allow it to stop you feel the fear and do it anyway susan jeffers great book do check it out i just love that great information the way that i deal with fear in business and money and all that stuff is i feel like and hopefully this doesn't sound arrogant i feel like i work for god okay and when you and again we're talking about spiritual entrepreneur so i literally see and you know, I use my intuition about absolutely everything from what I wear, you know, in the morning to how I work with my clients or the direction of my business. And when you feel like you're working for God, then if people come, I feel like, okay, God sent them. Sometimes people come, I'm like, how did you find me? I don't know. And it's, it's, so when you feel like you're working for God, then the flow of your life goes according to divine plan and divine timing. I remember one time about a year ago, I looked at my cal calendar for the day and I had nothing on it. I thought, this is weird. Usually I'm busy, you know? So I, I usually have clients all day. I, I end up going to the grocery on the way back. Someone rear ended me. <laughs> I was I like, Oh, okay. That's what I'm supposed to be doing all day. I have to deal with my wrecked car and it took all day. Oh, so, dear, yeah. so when you, that's a bad story, but, but when you really set your intention to serve God for the highest good of all, and you pay attention to that energy, it keeps you out of the fear. It keeps you in the flow of abundance and it keeps you in the flow of trust. At least that's my experience. Yeah. Now, I think it's great, actually. Yeah. I, I, can I just say something about that? I, I think you're course. right. I think I think spiritual entrepreneurs are angels incarnate and they're magicians. You know, like the, that kind of magical aspect of being an angel is like they can start creating the reality they want, whereas conventional business don't do that. But as you're a kind of business angel, a, a spiritual angel, a, a, a spiritual entrepreneur, you can start to focus on these higher dreams, highest energies you want, and they will start to be attracted to you, really. I mean, yes, there are challenges. Somebody may rear end your car and they may happen. But what can happen with a conventional person is they put so much angst and anger and resentment into these challenges and they forget the dreams. And actually, I think I try to put minimal energy into the challenges, I, enough to overcome it, enough to learn from it. But then it's like, where do you want to go? And I, I do know a few people who are spiritual entrepreneurs who are still putting far too much energy into the angst, into, the, you know, the devil is in the detail. Forget it. Move. What have you learned from it? Bless it and move on, you know. And so that was my advice for that. Sorry, but there we are. I had to say something about that. Oh, that, that's great insights. Now, Stephen Noble, in my work as a medical intuitive healer, I literally have an, an entire manual on clearing money issues because so many people's survival issues all go back to their relationship with money. And you would not be, maybe you wouldn't be surprised 
how many people's health issues all go back to money, even if it's like, I don't deserve to spend money to get well, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Right? So how can, in your professional opinions, how can spiritual entrepreneurs get out of rat race thinking about abundance? Yeah, well, you're right. I think for a lot of people, uh, money has become like oxygen. It's a bit like oxygen, isn't it? You need it. to. It should be there. Whereas auction is there all the time and, and the government hasn't found a way to tax it yet. Thank, thank God. But all sunshine, it's always there. So energy, money is energy. And most people will know that money is energy flow. Now, when I worked in banking, I kind of was working with all these large amounts of money in the city of London. And they seemed to me, even at that time, like streams of energy, like rivers of energy flowing through and out. And I looked at them and um what I noticed is in conventional, in the conventional world, some people were really able to handle money conventionally. And this is the old paradigm around money. The bigger your ego, the bigger your potential to have money. That's the old paradigm. You know, when I was in the banking, the ones with the biggest egos, the one who shouted the loud, loudest, the ones who can elbow everyone out the way, the ones who can climb, climb the corporate ladder did the best. But in the current paradigm, it's actually changing. It's not the biggest egos that are actually doing well. It's the ones who are more connected to spirit now. Now, energy, money is energy, and money, money wants to flow as energy, but money is not a clean energy. That's the trouble for spiritual people. It's not a clean energy. It's, it absorbs a lot of the projections of the human collective. There's billions of people on the planet now projecting anger, resentment, frustration, fear onto money. Now, when we want more money to flow into our life and our reality, we can also feel the energy of money, the pure energy of money. Money is just like electricity. It's pure and neutral. It's not good or bad. But it comes with all of the angst and all of the ugh and all of the stuff with it. And so what we have to learn is to filter that out. Now, I've got a playlist on my YouTube channel called Abundance Playlist. And there's a number of thick tracks on there about how do we filter out the angst of the collective, you know, all of their fear, because we don't want to be absorbing their fear, you know. So, and actually, spiritual entrepreneurs are performing a service by filtering out money and passing it on as pure, clean energy. That's what I feel. It's imagine it a bit like water. Mm. Imagine the river is really filthy, and there you are, and this river is filthy, and you are filtering it out and passing on that clear flow to others. That's one thing. That's one aspect of it. So that that's one aspect of cleaning money. But the other as there's another aspect to it. Imagine, let's use the metaphor of money again, of, of, of a river. Imagine money is, a, is water flowing to you like a river. And imagine that river can flow into a pool or a lake or a, or a pond. Now, how much of money are you allowing into your own personal space to accumulate? You know, some people will not allow money to accumulate. And they'll it will be diverted in all kinds of dramas and bills and everything but actually that's their own personal creation how much are we allowing in now for a spiritual entrepreneur for example their business may have one or two channels where money comes through it may come through healing it may come through podcasting it may come through webinars you know a few channels the challenge for for entrepreneurs is to expand the number of channels of money flow that can come into your own personal business expand them so instead of three make it 10 so i've got about 12 or 13 different flows of money that comes into my life in the moment and uh, one of them actually strangely is um i mean i'm at an age i'm a bit slightly older than you i'm, I'm getting pensions there's uh, at least three pensions flowing in which is like three pensions and there'll be a fourth one when i decide to cash it in like hey there's pensions but in terms of business there are lots of channels now i've opened up youtube i get a i get money through youtube i get money through various channels clients webinars events retreats um donations you know actually someone someone sent me where is it someone sent me i'm always getting sent gifts socks and all mm -hmm. kinds of things someone sent me a thousand pounds worth of crystals here's a beautiful uh crystal i think this one was valued at 700 dollars when they sent it to me carved uh pure crystal quite an expensive one this one quite a rare one apparently and uh, so money will flow in 
And I, at one stage in my life, if money flowed in, I had to get rid of it. I couldn't, couldn't accumulate it. And one of the core reasons a lot of spiritual people have is money is not, if I have money, I can't be spiritual. That's one of the core beliefs some people have. The more money I have, the more I'll be distracted, more pulled in the world, and the less I can meditate and be, you know, spiritual. That might have been true years ago when you had to go up on a mountain or in a cave. But nowadays, all of the spiritual people are in the world. They're not actually on a mountain because a lot of the real lessons now are about balancing the material world and the spiritual world and having both. This is the real challenge. It's not about being, you know, it's a lot of single people going off to a monastery and just meditating for 10 years. That's great. But what about being a mother or father of two or three kids and having grandchildren? That, that is a whole different level of being spiritual. So I've got four granddaughters. I'm seeing two of them tomorrow, actually, and my son and daughter-in-law, and I'm taking them out to the theater. So I love this whole idea of the children and grandchildren, my spiritual life. They look at me and they kind of think, well, granddad, you're kind of weird, granddad, but we love you. You know, they kind of think I'm a weird granddad, but that, that's all right. The other aspect of money is around how much our body, mind, body can tolerate which does come to our belief systems. So I've got a meditation on my um, YouTube channel, which is around imagine calling angels in and calling the energy of money in. How much can you, and I keep expanding it. Like how about a thousand units of your currency of money and angelic light? How about 500,000? How about a million? And I've done this meditation myself personally, and I've got up to a hundred million pounds in my body that I can hold comfortably a hundred million as energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And it does take a lot to really do it properly. And that's why a lot of people can't do it. They can't hold too much. So in some workshops, I would say, well, how much money have you ever earned per hour or per week or per month ever? That's your limit. Mm -hmm. That's the current limit. You have to go beyond that limit. So my current limit is about um, five, five and a half thousand pounds an hour was the most I've earned. So I'm like, wow, you know, that's an interesting experience I had. That was during lockdown. I earned up five and a half thousand pounds an hour for mm -hmm. delivering two hours, something. So, and I'm like, but what I've come to also, and I think a lot of people have to come to this is realize that money is, is, is just energy, as I mentioned, and it's not important. It flows in and it's fabulous. And what you can do with it, you can make a difference. You can help people. Like you were saying, you help people. It's not for me about having a bigger car. I do have a nice car, actually, because I have to drive around to retreats and everything. So I need a nice car. It's not about having a big house or a swimming pool. It's about having a life that works. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing. You know, and not wor I, I never worry about money. And the other thing I've got a rule is, uh, this is just a personal rule, is as soon as someone sends me an invoice, I pay it immediately, same day. Mm -hmm. And people are going, wow, you're paying. That's really fast. None of my clients ever pay me like that. But I have a rule that, that they're waiting for money. They've given me a service. Why should I make them wait? I pay them immediately. And all the, the amount of good vibes I get back for that is incredible. The amount of, they will go even further for me. Usually, you know, people like IT people or graphic designers, they will go way beyond what I'm asking them for because they see I treat them so well. So it's also practical stuff, how you treat people with money. I would say pay them quick, as quick as you can. You know, um, if you've got them, once you've got the money flow, pay immediately. It just creates a lot of good vibes, really. All right, Steve Noble, I think that's so funny that you do that. I do the exact same thing. And not only that, my regular people, like my bookkeeper, my accountant, my website designer, I pay them ahead of time. I'm like, oh, cool. there's, there's so much trust. I'm like, I just, I periodically, I send them a check. You know, I trust them. It's like, they're working for me. I trust them completely. And I'm, I'm paid in full and advanced. Right. Yeah. Right. Because it's, fabulous, a, yeah. it's a relationship. Right. Yeah. And, and I want to find the best people to help me. And then I pay them really well. <laughs> yeah. Ahead of time. Yeah. Now, in your wonderful book, The Spiritual Entrepreneur, and if you are wanting to start your own business or you already have a business and you want to do better, absolutely read this book. It's a great book. You have a fantastic affirmation, and I may butcher it, but I think it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm here to be seen. I've come to be heard. I've come to be visible. I have come to make a difference. And now when I dry my hair every morning, I use that affirmation because it's like, 
I'm showing up, right? I'm yeah. showing up to do my service to the planet. What, yeah. what do you think are some of the best ways for spiritual entrepreneurs to stop hiding and show up so that people who need them can find them? Yeah, the key, um, the, sorry, one of the core ways resistance shows up, fear will show up, is I want to, I want to be, I want to be visible. And entrepreneurs have to be visible. You can't be successful and not be visible. There's this conscious thing. I want to be visible, but an unconscious thing. I don't want to be visible. It's a kind of conflict that goes on in a lot of people. Some of that conflict can come from other lifetimes where they've been hurt or harmed in other lifetimes. The, the unconscious mind knows everything, remembers everything when you've been killed or hurt or harmed for speaking your truth or having a spiritual practice or being wealthy or successful. And so you might want to be wealthy, successful, spiritual, and your unconscious mind goes, it's dangerous. So there's a conflict. You have to make that conflict uh, conscious in order to, to rebalance and dissolve it because you, your unconscious mind needs to know, hey, we're not in that lifetime anymore. Joe Biden is not going to kill me for being a witch or a Reiki healer or a whatever, you know, or whoever the president will be in the future. Uh, when's your elections coming up? I don't know when they're coming up, but uh, uh, 2024. But 2024. I I appreciate you saying that because I, I've done a lot of work. I was a little girl in Nazi Germany and I have, you know, I've done a lot of work to remember. I was hiding under a table. They grabbed me. I was, went off and to the gas chamber. <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah. So clearing that out. And I love what you said. I'm, I'm not in that. I'm not in Nazi Germany anymore. Thank God. No. And so, you know, over here, uh rishi our prime minister he's not interested in spiritual you know they're not interested in spiritual people like years ago when religion was stronger it was it's different but now you can be as weird and wacky as you like and nobody's going to come knocking at your door the fbi or the cia are not going to knock at your door i guarantee your listeners are not going to knock at your door and mi5 are not going to knock at my door the police saying you're a healer we have to arrest you they, they, they there's too many weird people doing that stuff they're not interested they're interested in other stuff so um to be visible means truly to to, to really to feel, uh, you know, the statement. I'm. I'll, I'll change the statement. Really, I'm here to be seen, to be heard, to be ex, to be acknowledged, to be accepted, to to be loved, mm -hmm. to be on track, to make a difference, to be successful and abundant on my own terms. On my own terms is really important. Not on my parents' terms. Not on my ex boss's terms or my wife's terms. My terms. It's got to be yours. So if you let that statement in, as if you are here to be seen, you are here to be heard, you are here to be visible, you are here to be acknowledged, to be accepted, to be on track, to be abundant, to be happy, successful, to be loved on your own terms. And if you can fully let that in with no resistance, resistance will be a tightening of the body like, yeah, on, uh, but there's also a tightening somewhere. It's got to get to the point where there's, it goes in and you just feel expanded and no resistance. So it can be just using the affirmation. But there's lots of techniques around bringing to the surface old programs uh, around hiding. I remember when I was, I, I did some workshop and I had a memory of when I was 14, I was playing in an orchestra and uh, someone opened the window and all of my notes went flying. My musical notes went flying and I couldn't play. I stood there for about 40 minutes looking a complete idiot. And that humiliation, embarrassment came up when I started to be on my path. My, my, my unconscious mind said, look, this is what happened when you were 14. I remember in meditation, don't do it. And I said, look, um, that was when I was 14. Uh, you know, I had to actually have a conversation with these little bits, these sub personalities in me. So, um, yeah, it's, it's only unconscious programming, whether in this lifetime or other lifetimes or wherever it comes from, that has to be brought up. And you have to realize that you are gifted. You're a multidimensional soul. You've lived many lifetimes, got lots of talents, and you are here to make a difference. And your business is a great vehicle for that. And if you're going to hide, you will not be successful. So I'll, I'll finish this question with a story that I, 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 a healer friend of mine, very good healer friend of mine, um, wanted to be visible, but was invisible because one of her parents had a mental health issue and she really worried that this, this parent would find her. So she couldn't show herself on uh, social media. She couldn't show herself on the internet. And I don't know how she's doing, but as far as I know, she never resolved that issue of, I want to be seen, but I'm also hiding. Mm -hmm. And you have to resolve it so that you can be fully seen. And what I said to her was, look, your, your parent who's got a mental health issue is never going to find you as a weird and wacky healer. 
You know, he's not going to find you. Raise your vibration, increase your light, get out there and stop worrying about him. But she, I don't know if she's resolved it now. I've lost touch with her. So maybe she has, hopefully she has. Great story. And with that, let's take another break and listen to another message from one of our commercial sponsors here at UK Health Radio. And we'll be right back with Steve Noble, founder of Soul Matrix Healing. Steve Noble, years ago, Stuart Wilde, another spiritual author who unfortunately is now deceased, no longer yeah. with us, no longer writing wonderful books. Yeah. Um, he had a great saying, which is raise your vibration. And when people show up, charge them. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a great understanding for spiritual entrepreneurs, raise your vibration. And when people show up, um, charge them. One yeah. of the chapters in your book, The Spiritual Entrepreneur, that's so great, is your weirdness is your brilliance, which mm. kind of falls along with how so many people are hiding. How can embracing our true, authentic selves empower us to be successful in business? Yeah, good question. Well, I met Stuart Wilde a couple of times at Alternatives, and I went to one of his talks. He's very edgy and very, very following his own heart and his own path. Didn't care if he upset a few people. It was, it was kind of, I'm on my path and I'm going to do it. I'm going to say what I want to say. And I read I read a lot of his books and, and brilliant books. I think Little One of Miracles, I mean, that, that tiny one of miracles or The Trick to Money is Having Some, which is a fi very funny title. <laughs> um, I would say spiritual entrepreneurs are here to be weird, which could also be called unique, to be your, their unique selves. They're not here to be normal. They're not here to fit in. They're not here to worry about what the market wants. I don't worry about what the market wants so much. I think, what do I want to share? And I see if there's a response from the market, you know. Now, I put lots of stuff out, and I see some of what I put out is really well-received and some less well-received. And so I have a choice. Well, the market really wants this. I could give them more of that. So it's not about ignoring feedback, but it's about following your own true authentic self, what you really want to do. And for, for some, for example, someone on the healing path like us, if I've come to something that I need to healing myself and I do the process and I find some resolution, I put it out there and I say, hey, it's worked for me. It might work for you. So I think it's about avoiding being formulaic because unfortunately, so many people on social media are formulaic. Someone does something successful and they copy it. And to be honest, when I see anything formulaic, it switches me off immediately. I go, I'm not interested. You're just copying that. I can tell what you're doing. People, you know, when The Secret, that film, The Secret was successful, there was all these copycat films jumping on. When it's a successful book, all these copycat books come out and they're just formulaic and they never succeed really or very rarely succeed. Be yourself, do what you want to do, however weird and wacky, and you will succeed. If you are not, if you're worrying about the market, worrying about the government, worrying about the economy, you will not succeed. You've got to, it's where your passions and gifts meet the needs of the market. That wonderful meeting point is your success point. If you're giving stuff out the market's not interested in, you have to adjust. You go, nobody's interested. Maybe I should adjust something. And there are people out there just keep giving it. Nobody's interested and they just keep going. Sometimes that works out well and sometimes it doesn't, you know, so you have to go, well, I've been doing this for 20 years. Nobody's interested. Maybe I should rethink it, you know, but I'd say, you know, <laughs> if you put stuff out there, it will take a year or so for it to catch on if it's completely new. You know, most, for example, most cult TV shows at the beginning, people look at it, what, what's that? You know, what, why is that? That's weird. But then it become these cult TV shows like, you know, the uh, Big Bang Theory you know, at the beginning was probably seen as weird. And over in England, we have something called 40 Towers. The first three or four months, I thought, what is this show? But then it becomes totally addictive. It's so wacky and new. And new. It's not following the Hollywood formula. And now Hollywood has a formula. I know the formula because we've had people come to England teaching the script writing formula. And you, you can, you can tell the Hollywood film from a, a, a European film because it's a different formula. So I would say, don't be formulaic, 
the market wants authenticity. It wants creativity. It doesn't want the same old, does not want the same old. And there are great uh, marketeers coming out now. I don't know if you've heard of a guy called Seth Godin, Catherine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. I love his books. He's not particularly spiritual, but he's really on it. And I think he's got a book called about weird, follow your weird or something. He's got a couple of books about weird. And he's basically saying, be true to yourself, be authentic, be creative. He uses the word weird. He's not doing it in a spiritual sense, but I'm using it in a spiritual sense. Talk about past lives. Talk about healing the Akash, clearing the Akashic records. Talk about this stuff. You know, even if your mother and father will be freaked out by it, the market won't. <laughs> you know, my ex-wife used to say to me, what cult are you in now, Steve? And uh, I used to say, well, she was a Catholic. I used to say a better one than you, you know, <laughs> clearly she never thought she never saw the joke. But, you know, my family don't understand anything I'm doing, but the market does, you know. So that's the thing. Follow your heart and there will be people in the world that would totally love what you do. You know, and there are people nowadays, you know, I spoke yesterday to someone who's a transgender artist, successful putting out art for the transgender audience. You know, you can, you can do anything these days. There's always an audience looking for you to fulfill their needs and their dreams. So don't be shy. Great inspiration. You've been listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Our guest today has been the one and the only Steve Noble, founder of Soul Matrix Healing, author of The Spiritual Entrepreneur. And remember, if you're thinking about starting a business in natural healing, you can do it. <laughs> Just Create your own word, create your own reality, follow your own heart, follow your guidance. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.